right, so let's take a look at our second topic here, and that is going to be chemical bonding. Uh, we're going to look at ionic bonds versus covalent bonds, and then talk about special types of covalent bonds. So ultimately, um, atoms are trying to achieve st stability, and atoms are going to then react with one another to form molecules. So after atoms react, they have a completed outer shell, which would make them stable. Atoms are most stable when the outer shell has eight electrons. This is the octet rule. So atoms exchange electrons in order to have a complete outer shell or valence shell. So the, most, uh, the, the electrons in the outermost shell or orbital are what we call valence electrons. So if you look here, here's how the periodic table is arranged with some of the elements cut out. So group one here would be uh, the alkali metals. Group two here is the alkaline earth metals. And then we're going to skip the transition metals and jump right over to group three, which is the boron family. Group four, as indicated by the Roman numeral here, is the carbon family. Group five, nitrogen family. Group six, oxygen family. Group seven, fluorine. Um, this, which is fluorine there, this is known as your, your halogens, the salt-forming elements, and group 8 here, which are the noble gases or inert gases because they are stable. So why did I need to review that? The group number, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, is going to tell you how many electrons for, for those elements are found in the outermost shell. So all elements in group one have one valence electron. All elements in group two have two valence electrons, so on and so forth. So let's put this into, into use. So here are models of the six elements that are, are predominant in living things. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur are chinops elements. And if you look, carbon, uh, yeah, carbon, a hydrogen is a group one element. It has that one valence electron. If you jump over to carbon, carbon is a group four element in the carbon family. It has four valence electrons, so on and so forth. The diagram that you see here is representative of a Bohr model. So compounds and molecules. A compound in itself is two or more different elements that are bonded together. And then a molecule is the smallest part of a compound that still has or maintains the properties of that compound. Well, how does this all happen? Let's ask ourselves this question. What is a chemical bond? The first type of chemical bond is known as an ionic bond. And ionic bonds occur when electrons are being transferred. So, when electrons get transferred, remember that on the periodic table, the atoms are ele uh, electrically, electrically neutral, which means the number of protons and the number of electrons in those atoms are equal in number, which means that the number of positive charged protons being equal to the number of electrically charged electrons are going to cancel each other out to make that atom neutral. However, atoms are going to, in the case of ionic bonding, are going to transfer electrons. So one atom is going to lose an electron, another atom is going to gain an electron. And this is what we see happening between uh, metals and nonmetals. So when you lose an electron, when an atom, such as a metal, loses an electron, it's going to gain a net positive charge. We call that a cation which is C-A-T-I-O-N. When an atom gains that electron that was lost, it's going to get a net negative charge because it's gaining those electrons which are negatively charged. That is what we call an anion. Anions are spelled A-N-I-O-N. So ions with opposite charges are going to attract because opposite charges attract. And that bond, that electrostatic attraction, is what we refer to as an ionic bond. So this is what I like to call the oxidation-reduction reaction atomic bullying. 
because the atoms that are going to be oxidized are going to be those metals. They're going to lose those electrons, and the nonmetals, being more electronegative, are going to gain those electrons and therefore be reduced. So here's a good example. This is a sodium chloride. If you look, sodium is a group one element, so it has one valence electron. Chlorine is a halogen in group seven. It has seven valence electrons. So to become chemically stable, sodium needs to get rid of that one electron and chlorine needs to gain one electron to have a complete outer shell of electrons following that octet rule. Remember that a complete outer shell, which is eight electrons, gives atom gives atoms their chemical stability, all right? And it is a much easier for sodium to give up its one electron, as seen here, to chlorine, than for chlorine to give up all its seven valence electrons to sodium. So when sodium does give up that one valence electron to chlorine, the sodium atom is going to gain a, a net positive charge because now the number of protons in the nucleus outnumber the number of electrons in the orbitals by one, gaining a plus charge. Over here, chlorine gaining that one electron, you're going to get a net negative charge. Now it's an anion. Remember, both of these are considered ions because they're atoms with net charges. So here we have our cation, here we have our anion. Having gained that one charge, now the electrons in the orbitals surrounding the chlorine atom's nucleus outnumber the protons of the chlorine atom by one. So you get a charge of one minus. And that electrostatic attraction between the two is a new compound called sodium chloride, which is ionic bonding. So that electrostatic attraction is ionic bond, forming the new compound sodium chloride, also commonly referred to as table salt. If you look at the diagram here, you can see how the sodium and chlorine atoms are going to be arranged. So the sodium ion is going to line up with the chlorine ion in that cube of salt. Let's take a look. In today's video, we're going to take a look at how particles can bond together through ionic bonds. And to explain this, we'll take a look at some dot and cross diagrams. First though, I just want to recap what ions are. We said in a previous video that ions are formed when atoms lose or gain electrons. And we can show this happening with equations. For example, a sodium atom will go to form a sodium one plus ion plus one electron. We know this because if we look at a diagram of a sodium atom, it has one electron in its outermost shell that it needs to lose in order to become stable. Because remember, stability is all about having a full outer shell. Meanwhile, for chlorine, we'd write that chlorine plus an electron, which we can see it needs to complete its outer shell, goes to form a one minus chloride ion. Now, this is all well and good in theory. But in real life, these reactions don't happen in isolation. Instead, we normally talk about a transfer of electrons. From an atom that has too many, like sodium, to an atom that doesn't have enough, like chlorine. Once this electron has been transferred, both atoms become ions, with full outer shells of electrons. So we put big square brackets around them, and their charge in the top right corner. The important bit here is that the two ions have opposite charges, so they'll be attracted to each other by electrostatic forces to form an ionic compound. We call this force an ionic bond, and it's really strong, similar in strength to trivalent bonds, which we cover in another video. The way that we've drawn our compound here is known as a dot and cross diagram, and you'll often be asked to draw things this way in your exam. To do it properly, there are a couple of features to notice though. One is that we've drawn the electrons of one atom as dots, and the other as crosses. 
This is so that we can tell which electrons belong to which atom. And you should show the movement of any electrons with an arrow. Notice that in this dot and cross diagram, we've shown every electron shell of the atoms. Sometimes, though, you'll be told you only have to draw the outermost shell, which is a bit quicker to draw. And for our example, it would look like this. Let's consider a harder example. Draw the dot and cross diagram for the formation of magnesium chloride, MgCl2. Only draw the outermost shells. Now, this time, we can see that we have three atoms in the compound, rather than two. To start, let's draw out our reactants. We have magnesium, which has two electrons in its outer shell that it wants to get rid of, and we have two chlorines, both of which have seven outer electrons. So we need one more each. The next step is to think about where the electrons could move to make all the electrons happy with a full outer shell. And as a general rule, electrons will move from the metal to the non-metal. So in this case, magnesium can give one electron to each of the two chlorines. As a result, we'll end up with a magnesium 2 plus ion and two chloride 1 minus ions. This is now pretty much done. However, in dot and cross diagrams involving more than two ions, we generally arrange the ions like they would be arranged in a real compound. So because the chlorides would both be attracted to the positive magnesium, we place them on either side of it. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, then do share it with your friends. And All right. The second type of bond is what we call a covalent bond. And a covalent bond occurs when electrons are being shared between atoms. So ultimately, you're not going to have a transfer of electrons from one atom to another. They're going to be shared. And covalent bonds occur between two nonmetals. So it's going to be a nonmetal with a nonmetal on the periodic table. When two atoms do not have completely full outer shells, aka valence electrons, they may share electrons so that each fulfills that outer shell agreement, that octet rule. An example there would be hydrogen gas. Really quick, hydrogen, although it's located on the metal side of the periodic table with other metals, it is actually a gas that is a nonmetal. So that's an exception to where nonmetals and metals are found. So hydrogen is a nonmetal found in that group one because it has that one valence electron. And ultimately, um, when you when we look at the bonding of two nonmetals to form a covalent bond, we use certain bond notations. Those bond notations are what we call a single covalent bond written as one little bar in between. That bar represents the single bond, which is two valence electrons. A double covalent bond is written as two bars, so that would be two covalent bonds, and in there, there are two electrons being shared here in that first bond, and there are two electrons being shared down here in that second bond. The final type of covalent bond is what we call a triple covalent bond. Triple covalent bonds look as such. So you have three bars represented between the atoms to show that they are sharing those electrons. And each bar, your, or in this case, each covalent bond is represented by two electrons being shared between those atoms. So as far as bond strength, I would write this down. Ionic bonds going from, from weaker, weaker bonds to more uh, stronger bonds, it would go ionic bonds, and then it would go a single covalent bond is a little bit stronger, a double covalent bond is even more stronger, and then the strongest there would be a triple covalent bond. But there are bonds that are weaker than ionic bonds, and we're going to talk about those a little bit. So here we can see uh, the electron models for hydrogen gas oxygen gas, and methane. Additionally, we could see the structural formula represented showing how that single covalent bond, double covalent bond, 
And then here we have carbon as a central atom with four single covalent bonds, each one sharing an electron with hydrogen. And then we have their molecular formula, H2O2 and CH4. So we're going to do some practice with this in class. Let's take a look at the covalent bond video. In today's video, we're going to look at how atoms can form covalent bonds by sharing electrons. And we'll also see all the different ways that we can draw these covalent bonds. So very quickly recap, we've already seen how some atoms can form ionic bonds by transferring electrons from one atom to the other. This makes oppositely charged ions that are then attracted to each other through electrostatic forces which hold them together. And the reason that they transfer these electrons is so they both get a full outer shell. Now this works great when one of the atoms has too many electrons and the other one has too few, like with sodium and chlorine. But what about when we have two non-metal elements, like two chlorine atoms? Well, in this case, both of them need an extra electron to get a full outer shell. So giving electrons to each other isn't going to help. Instead, what they can do is share some electrons. And as each atom needs one extra electron, they each share one of their own. So that together, two are being shared, and they each get one extra. The way that we've drawn this is called a dot and cross diagram. And when you do these, you need to make sure that you draw one of the atoms with dots and the other with crosses, so that we can tell which electrons belong to each. Also, even though we've only drawn the outermost shell of each atom here, you might sometimes have to draw all of the shells. Just make sure you check the question to see what they want. An easier way to draw covalent molecules, though, is with a displayed formula where we just write the chemical symbols of the atoms and use lines to join the atoms that are covalently bonded together. The great thing about these is that it's easy to draw big molecules that would take too long or be too complicated to draw as dot and cross diagrams. For example, this here is a molecule of sugar called glucose, which you don't need to know about specifically, but you do need to be able to recognize that this is a displayed formula. The downside of displayed formulas, though, is that they don't show you anything about the 3D shape of the molecule. For this, we can use a 3D model, which tries to show how the atoms are actually arranged in real life. For a slightly harder example, let's try to draw the covalent bonding in ammonia, which we just saw. It has the molecular formula NH3, so we can tell that there's one nitrogen and three hydrogen atoms. And the first step is to draw all of these out. In our example, we'll only draw the outermost shells. The next step is to think about how these atoms can fit together so that all of them have full outer shells. Remember that because this is hydrogen's first energy level, it can only hold a maximum of two electrons. So each hydrogen is going to need one extra electron to fill their shell. Whereas, because this is nitrogen's second energy level, it can hold a maximum of eight electrons. So it's looking for an extra three electrons to become full. So if each hydrogen shared one electron with the nitrogen, then all of the atoms would have full outer shells. And that would be our dot and cross diagram all done. Or if we wanted the displayed formula instead, we would just rub out all of the shells and electrons, and instead place lines wherever electrons were being shared, which just means placing a line wherever there was a covalent bond. Now, when it comes to the 3D model, things get a bit trickier because it's hard to predict what shape the molecule will make. Luckily though, you don't have to know this just yet. You just need to be able to recognize them. The last thing we need to cover is the types of substances that covalent bonds can make. The examples we've seen so far, like chlorine and ammonia, are called simple molecular substances, which are small molecules in which the atoms in the molecule are joined by strong covalent bonds. But between the individual molecules, there are only weak intermolecular forces, which are easily broken. Other simple molecular substances worth knowing are water, which is H2O, and methane, which is CH4. 
Covalent bonds can also be used to make much larger structures though, such as polymers and giant covalent structures. We cover both of these in other videos, but basically polymers are long chains made up of lots of repeating units, which we call monomers, and are used to make things like plastic bags and t-shirts. Meanwhile, giant covalent structures are things like silicon dioxide, diamond, and graphite, which can involve billions or trillions of atoms, arranged in a regular lattice. And because all of the atoms are joined by covalent bonds, they're really strong. Anyway, that's all for now. So, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then please do tell your friends about it. And we'll see you next time. All right, finishing up the lecture. Um, so there is the ball and stick model showing you. Uh, he used that in the, the videos. And over here, this is what a space filling model would look like in chemistry. So this would be, um, if you look at methane, CH4, you have a central carbon atom and surrounding it, you have four hydrogen atoms. Here you have that central carbon atom. Here are the four hydrogen atoms. There's the fourth one back there. So ultimately, this is a chemical reaction um, when you form something new that is a chemical change. And in that, you have the exchange of electrons between atoms to create chemical reactions. Or you could have the sharing of electrons. So in this particular chemical reaction, which is carbon dioxide with water to form glucose and oxygen, our equation for photosynthesis, um, over here on this side, of the equation. This is what we refer to as the reactants. And then the arrow is pointing to what is formed in the chemical reaction known as the products. That arrow in any arrow in a chemical reaction or a chemical equation is going to represent yielding. So carbon dioxide plus water yields glucose plus oxygen. Lastly, there are two types of covalent bonds that are special. This is a nonpolar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond. Nonpolar covalent bonds are when electrons are being shared evenly or equally between those atoms. The opposite is a polar covalent bond. And in a polar covalent bond, you're going to have the unequal sharing of electrons. And that's due to electronegativity differences. Electronegativity is the attraction of an atom for the electrons in a covalent bond. So it's the ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself. So polar bonds have charges on either end and often attract each other. So if I take a look back here, this is of water. So here we see water. Water is a polar covalent bonded molecule, or what we say a polar molecule, because oxygen is very electronegative. So as you go across the periodic table from the left to the right, going from the metals to the nonmetals, electronegativity increases. So the ability of those atoms to pull electrons away from other atoms is stronger. Fluorine is the most electronegative element on the periodic table. We're going to exclude those group A elements because they have a full outer shell of electrons and are therefore inert. Why they're known as the noble gases or the inert gases. So in this case, oxygen being in, in that group, uh, which would be group six, is more electronegative because as you go up in a group and over to the left, you're going to increase electronegativity. So oxygen has greater electronegativity than hydrogen. So it has a stronger ability or, or need to pull those electrons away from the hydrogen. In doing so, the oxygen atom gets a slightly partial negative charge, and the hydrogen atoms get slightly partial positive charges on them. These aren't full charges because the electrons are still being shared between the, the atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. Unlike an ionic bond where you have a complete transfer of an electron.
And in ionic bonds, you get a full charge, but here you only get slightly, uh, slightly positive or, or slightly negative charges on those atoms within the molecule. And ultimately, um, polar bonds having those charges on either end are going to want to create an attraction. And that attraction is what we call a hydrogen bond. When a hydrogen is bonded to an electronegative atom, it becomes electropositive. And ultimately, this causes it to be attractive to the electronegative parts of the same or other molecules. Let's look at polar covalent compounds. that bond with an oxygen atom. These atoms are sharing electrons, which makes this a covalent bond. But here's the thing. Oxygen has eight protons in the nucleus, and each hydrogen only has one pathetic proton in their nuclei. The ability for oxygen to attract the electrons is stronger than hydrogen's ability. This is known as electronegativity. But I think of it as electron bullying, because oxygen is going to have the electrons around its nucleus more often than the hydrogens have the electrons around theirs. As a result, the oxygen side becomes slightly negative, and the hydrogens become slightly positive. This is an example of a polar covalent compound. The positive and negative ends create poles, like the ends of a magnet. But not all compounds have this kind of relationship. On the spectrum of bond polarity, Non-polar covalent bonds share electrons very equally and don't create poles. Polar covalent bonds share electrons unequally and create dipoles, which also cause some intermolecular attractions. And ionic bonds are so polar that the electrons are actually transferred to the more electronegative element, and their charges attract them to one another, forming an ionic bond. Let's look at some examples of the covalent bonds. Non-polar covalent bonds share electrons equally. Examples include all of the Brinkelhoff twins, like nitrogen, and oxygen, and fluorine, but also other molecules like carbon dioxide that have atoms with really similar electronegativities. Polar covalent bonds, or just polar bonds, have bonding electrons that are shared unequally, like hydrogen chloride, which is also called hydrochloric acid. The chlorine atom attracts the electrons more than the hydrogen atom, so the chlorine becomes slightly negative and the hydrogen slightly positive. We can symbolize this partial charge with the Greek letter delta. Fluorine gets a partial negative, and hydrogen gets the partial positive. One of the most important polar molecules for life is water. These water molecules prefer to have opposite ends near each other. The slightly negative oxygen ends are near the slightly positive hydrogen end. The polarity of water makes it great at dissolving lots of different substances that are also polar. The water molecules have slight attractions to each other, and even to other molecules. These attractions between molecules are called intermolecular forces, and they are much weaker than either ionic or covalent bonds. But just because they're weaker doesn't mean they aren't important. Intermolecular forces play a big role in determining the state of matter of a substance, like solid, liquid, or gas. The particular intermolecular force between hydrogen atoms that are covalently bonded to a very electronegative atom that is also weakly bonded to another atom's unshared pair or partially negative region of a molecule is called a hydrogen bond. So it's basically the attraction between the partially positive hydrogen to the partially negative region of the atom. In this case, the negative region is oxygen, and that's a hydrogen bond. But bond isn't the best word, because it's so much weaker than an ionic or covalent bond. It has only about 5% of the strength of the average covalent bond, but it's still the word that's commonly used. These hydrogen bonds give water a lot of its unique properties, like its ability to form droplets, or maintain the surface tension when a water strider bug is on it. Thanks for watching this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And All right, we'll talk a little bit more about the water molecule, hydrogen bonding, and some special properties of water. That's it for today. Thank you for tuning in. Enjoy your day.